Chapter 41 of The Goddess of Atvatabar by William Richard Bradshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Fisher. We are attacked by the enemy. Captain Wallace and the entire ship's company were overjoyed at my escape from the clutches of the enemy. The loss of six of our brave sailors was a terrible calamity in any case, but still more so in view of the impending attack by the enemy's navy. We had a good stock of gunpowder on board, and the ship's mechanics under Professor Rackiron began the construction of a series of machine guns, each weapon having 100 rifled barrels arranged in circles around the central tube. 25 of these guns were constructed. To each tube was fitted a magazine with automatic attachment, so that one man could handle each weapon that would fire 500 balls with each charge of the magazine. The Fletchermings of the Royal Navy possessed the advantage of numbers and ships, so that it was necessary for us to have the advantage in point of arms. Our monster Terrorite gun and the Terrorite battery gave us also an immense advantage over the gunpowder batteries of the enemy. Thus equipped, we were more than a match for any ten ships of the enemy. But when we saw one hundred vessels, the smallest of which was as large as our own, and many twice our size, Bearing down on us in battle array, we felt our chances of escape, not to mention victory, were hardly worth calculating. It was a splendid scene for a naval battle. The harbour of Kioran was a bay fully fifty miles in diameter, and here lay the royal fleet, whose hulls of gleaming gold shone on the blue water, while beyond rose the brilliant whiteness of the sculptured city. Captain Wallace had the ship ready for action. Every soul knew it was a life or death struggle. The sailors knew that success meant wealth beyond the dreams of avarice. For myself, the prize was something more worthy of our desperate courage. It was the priceless Leone, possessed of a divine personality. Her life, like my own, hung in the balance. Should I win the battle, we should win each other. Should I fail to conquer, there was but one kind of defeat, and that was death. Every man stood at his post in silence. Flathootley had command of a company of sailors. Professor Rackiron superintended our chief arm of defence, the Terrorite guns. Weapons like our revolvers, fortunately unknown in Atvatabar. We had a large quantity of explosive Terrorite on board in the shape of shells for our guns. The shells contained each the equivalent of a hundred pounds of Terrorite. That is to say, they would each weigh a hundred pounds on the outer earth, while the shells of the giant gun weighed 250 pounds each. The iron hurricane deck that did a such service in the polar climate was put up overhead as a protection from the onslaught of a boarding crew. The ships of the enemy advanced proudly in a double line of battle. On the peak of each floated the ensign of Atvatabar, a red sun surrounded by a wide circle of green on a field of blue. On the polar king floated the flag of the goddess, a figure of the throne of the gods in gold on a purple ground. When but a mile off we could see the guns on every ship pointed and ready for attack, the enemy suddenly broke into the form of a semicircle. It was the design of Admiral Jolar to surround us and capture or destroy the Polar King by sheer force of numbers. We allowed the formation to proceed until the entire navy of Atvatabar surrounded us in an enormous circle. Having executed this manoeuvre, a boat put away from the Admiral's ship and approached us. In a short time it reached our vessel and the captain of the Admiral's ship with several officers came on board. The captain demanded my unconditional surrender. In the name of his majesty, King Almeri Bulmakar of Atvatabar, I had been declared an enemy of the country, a violator of its most sacred laws, a heretic in active destruction of its holy faith, and a fugitive from justice. The captain, as the emissary of the admiral, demanded the immediate surrender of myself and the entire company. I asked my men if they were prepared to surrender themselves to the enemy. Their fearful shout of, Never! disturbed the silence of the sea, and must have been heard by the distant enemy. "'You hear the reply of my men,' I said to the captain. "'Tell your admiral that the commander of the Polar King declines to surrender.' "'Then,' said the captain, "'we will fire upon you at once. We mean to have you dead or alive.' "'Give the admiral my compliments,' said I, "'and tell him to open the fight as soon as he likes.' The captain and his staff rapidly disappeared, and we knew that the fight was certain. The officers had no sooner reached the Admiral's ship than a report was heard, and a ball of metal crashed upon the hurricane deck overhead, tearing a large hole in it, and then plunged into the sea. This was the signal of war. Before we could reply, the Polar King was the target of general bombardment from all points of the compass. The balls that struck us were of different kinds of metal. 
lead, zinc, iron and even gold. Although the range of their guns was accurate, yet owing to the loss of gravity, the shots had but little effect on the planting of the vessel. Some of the sailors were severely wounded, being struck in the limbs with large missiles hurled upon us, and I saw that if the enemy couldn't sink the Polar King, they could at least kill us, which was even worse. I gave orders to Professor Rackiron to train the giant gun on the Admiral's vessel. The discharge was accompanied by a slight flash, without smoke, and we saw the deadly messenger make its aerial flight straight towards the Admiral's vessel. It entered the water right in front of the ship, and in another instant an extraordinary scene was witnessed. The ship, in company with a vast volume of water, sprang into the air to a great height, with an immense hole blown in the bottom of the hull. Falling again, she sank with all of the crew who did not manage to fly clear of her rigging. After the vessel disappeared, the last of the water spout fell upon the boiling sea. It was a great surprise to the enemy to see their best ship destroyed at a single blow. The effect of our shot completely paralysed the foe for a moment, for every vessel ceased firing at us. At first it was thought that the Admiral had gone down with his vessel, and, until a new Admiral was in command, the battle would be suspended. During the confusion, we ran the Polar King through the breach made in the circle of the enemy, keeping his ships on one side of us. I determined to try the tactics of rapid movement with the steady discharge of the Terrorite gun, hoping to destroy a ship at every blow. It soon appeared that Admiral Jolmar was still alive, he having escaped from his ship in mid-air with his staff and a number of Fletchermings by means of their electric wings. He had alighted on the ship of the rear admiral, where he hoisted the pennant of the admiral. The enemy was now thoroughly alive to the necessity of destroying or capturing us. I saw it was a mistake in allowing ourselves to be surrounded in a bay only 50 miles wide. To fight so many ships required ample sea room to avoid the possibility of being captured. The admiral sent ten ships to guard the mouth of the bay. It was a satisfaction to know that the torpedo was also unknown in that vat bar, else our career would have been cut short. The Polar King, running 25 miles an hour, was followed by the enemy's fleet, which, although slower in movement, had the advantage of numbers and could possibly drive us upon the shore. After sailing as far east as we cared to go, the Polar King lay to, awaiting a renewal of the battle. End of chapter 41